nothing really quite like a good yoga session to get me to relieve my stress. I walk in, a bundle of nerves, tension, and stress, and I walk out really feeling relaxed, stable, and definitely more flexible. I guess it's a bit of a coping mechanism for me. It's not my only coping mechanism, but it definitely works really well. I'm not the only person who thinks this, though. Recent studies actually have shown that GABA, which is a little bit like endorphins or oxytocin, travels around in the brain and goes up during a yoga class. So we're looking at about 27% increase only an hour after yoga. It's no wonder, really, that it's very good at chilling me out. So GABA is almost like the grand inhibitor in the brain. What it does is it looks at these neurons that are firing away like crazy and says, shh, it's going to be okay. So it's really quite marvelous. So that's my coping mechanism. But when I look around the room, I'm sure other people have coping mechanisms that are equally as effective. While you may actually turn to alcohol, you could be a heavy smoker, and you could go for a run after work. But I'd like to introduce you to Luke. Luke is 32 years old, he's homeless, and he's addicted to heroin. I know right now you're probably thinking, wow, she went really dark really soon. One minute we're talking about yoga, the next minute heroin, we're preparing a syringe, life's over. But it's not that random. The reason why I'm bringing up Luke is because in the past few months, I've been working with heroin addicts. As part of my work for Frog Design, we've been trying to figure out whether Luke cares about his health. Is it true that he doesn't care about his health because he's a heroin injector? Or is it that he cares, but he doesn't know how to get healthy? So this was one of the questions that we needed to answer. And the only way to answer it was to actually develop some empathy for Luke. When I first started working with people like Luke, I thought, how am I going to empathize with somebody that's so different from me? But it then became pretty obvious that heroin was a coping mechanism for me. And the more that I talked to him, the more that I talked to his social worker, his doctor, I realized that actually, there's a very good reason why Luke turned to heroin and not yoga at the age of 21. I'm going to quote here Mark, one of the social workers that we worked with on the field. I think it really shows what really you can start thinking about when you think about injected drug users. He said, no one chooses to be homeless or start injecting drugs. If given the option, heroin addicts will always choose not to be addicted. But had their lives followed the same rhythm as yours or mine, we wouldn't be here talking about this subject. So what is this subject exactly? So I explained to you a little bit that we wanted to find out if Luke cared about his health. But to go a little bit deeper, we needed to understand what risks he is putting himself through by injecting on the streets. As you can imagine, Injecting on the streets is not the healthiest thing to do. But we were specifically looking at something called hepatitis C. Hepatitis C can go undetected for years. Just like HIV, it is transmitted through blood. But it's much more infectious. Current treatment rates appear to be the lowest in injected drug users. But if you think about it, injected drug users are always dealing with blood. The most disturbing thing, though, is that hepatitis C, unlike HIV, is actually curable. So we have a disease that is actually curable. We know who we need to treat, but we're not treating them effectively. Now, that's a cause for concern. It's not humane. Just to illustrate the fact a little bit more, we've got 15 million adults in the EU with hepatitis C. 58% of them were infections through injecting drugs. 58 is probably underreported because when you go up to somebody and say, 
do you inject heroin or any other drug? Their instinct is probably to say no. Then you ask again, their instinct is again no. So, you know, you get the idea. So, what is it that we need to do to try and understand these undertreated people? It's not enough to just talk to Luke and Luke's friends. It's about understanding the situation that Luke is in. I spoke about his background before, and it's about really trying to understand his journey, his everyday journey and his everyday life. And this is one of the journeys that I'd like to show. So if we look at the core, which is the hospital, we need to talk to the doctors that may have seen him. Then if he goes to a mobile treatment for another infection, what can the nurses tell us about Luke there? The needle exchange pharmacy is very important too. We have a pharmacist who's seeing Luke practically every other day as he brings these injections to her or him. What does she have to say about Luke? What does she know about him that can help us? And finally, something that isn't connected to health can also be that clue to tell us how we should treat Luke. Somebody, for example, that works at the mobile food kitchen that serves him food that has developed a, a relationship with him. What does he know that we don't? And as I said before, this is just a journey in a very big ecosystem. If you look at it as an onion layer, the real core of it is our healthcare by the hospital. But then as you go further and further out, you also see peripheral services. If this person chooses to sleep in a church and talks to the priest every day, the priest may know a lot about him. If this person is an immigrant and goes to a mosque, the same applies. So you have to be open to every touch point because you don't know where the clues are coming from. So at this point, we've talked about the subject and the problem. We've talked about one person that we need to design for, but he's not the only one. As you remember from my previous slide, it's drug users and ex-drug users that are at risk. And so let me introduce you to the other people that could also benefit from a different healthcare system. On this matrix, you'll see that drug use is on the horizontal axis, and it's actually going down. So the high drug use is on the left-hand side, and then you've got on the vertical axis, illness severity. So the more ill you are, the more symptoms you're showing, you'll be up on the top of that one. So Luke is termed a chaotic person, not because I'm being judgmental and calling him chaotic, but he has a chaotic life. When you inject drugs, it's about the highs, lows, trying to get food, trying to stay healthy, it's chaos. So if he does have hepatitis C, his symptoms are going to be quite low, simply because it's a chronic virus, so it'll take time before he actually gets sick. Catherine, on the other side, is very well integrated in society. She used to take drugs, maybe in her 30s or 20s, but has now moved on from it. If she contracted hepatitis C, she's probably pretty sick right now. And she doesn't use drugs anymore. So for her, her life isn't chaotic and she's probably not transmitting hepatitis C. Finally, you've got somebody like Margaret. Margaret, we call her in transition. She's trying to get clean. She's making steps towards it. But one thing could make her turn into Luke or maybe a very stable, good detox program will turn her into Catherine. The arrows are really about showing that it's fluctuating. So we really have a delicate balance to play with somebody like Margaret. So these are our three people, Luke, Margaret, and Catherine. They're very different people. They're a heterogeneous group. We can't make generalizations, but we can put them into archetypes. We can put them into informed generalizations that will tell us who we're designing for. So we know who they are, but what are their needs? Trust. 
There's different flavors of trust, really, when we talk about these three people. For Luke, the trust really comes from, can I trust this doctor? Is this doctor going to turn me into the authorities? Does he care about me? For Margaret, it's, is this doctor going to push me to rehab too quickly and then I'll snap? Is he going to judge me if I inject here and there during my program? And for Catherine, it's, I don't want to talk about my previous life. I gave that away. Can I trust this person with my deep, dark secrets? For Luke, it's about flexibility. There is no way that Luke will be able to make an appointment that's a 10-minute window at 10 a.m. He needs to think about breakfast. He needs to think about his dog. He needs maybe to think about his kids. And if he's really, really cold, he might need to see if he can get a sweater from somewhere because it started snowing. So for him to go to an appointment at the other edge of the city is completely unrealistic. For Margaret, she is yearning for that stability. So she's saying, look, I will try and do something about this, but don't push me too hard. So for her, a schedule could actually start working. Finally, for Catherine, it's about discretion. It's about, I haven't told my husband I used to inject heroin. How am I going to tell a doctor or a nurse that works with my husband? Or how am I going to tell my friends and family? And finally, awareness. This one is not really different flavors, but it's more around showing the awareness in different ways. So reaching out to them in different ways. And if I actually look at these needs, I don't think any of them are unrealistic, and I'm sure you'd agree. I mean, you look at trust and you think, well, I trust my doctor. That's why I go to the doctor. He studied probably more than I have, so he knows what he's doing. I also have the flexibility because I have a job, and my job says to me, take a sick day, we'll be okay. In terms of stability, I've also got that through my family, through my job again, because I know I'll get paid even if I go to the doctor. And when it comes to discretion, I also have faith in the medical system that the nurse will not be sharing my results with everybody else. But maybe I feel better about that because I don't have that much to hide. Finally, when it comes to awareness, I'm sure you've all done it. The doctor gives you half a diagnosis and there you are Googling every symptom under the sun, a comorbidity, a patient group, your mind's already racing thinking like, I'm gonna die tomorrow. So there's a hyper-awareness actually in our society, but not necessarily in these people. So as I said, these aren't unreasonable needs. So why aren't they being met by our current system? It's simply because our system isn't designed for people like them. It's a healthcare system that we need to humanize. And as much as I would like to say that as designers we designed underground tunnels and we then brought in Superman to take Luke to this appointment and you know, Margaret just had everything happening for her and everything was great. That's not really what was needed. What was needed was just a simple, effective solution to try and bridge my healthcare world with their healthcare world. And so I will take you through some of the solutions that we actually um, designed and these aren't all of the solutions that we design, they're just the ones that illustrate this bridging that I'm talking about. The first one is awareness. For Catherine, the way that we want her to become aware is in a very discreet way. So she gets a letter from her general practitioner that says, hey Catherine, you know, actually it seems to be that from your results we've seen a couple of things that don't really match or you're 75 now, maybe it's time to get a health check. The real reason behind this letter is we think she has hepatitis C, but you don't say it like that because it will put her off. She also gets a little barcode at the bottom of the letter that she can scan at her nearest pharmacy and get tested anonymously. So suddenly, Catherine is just the barcode. And because she's just the barcode, she feels much more comfortable. 
She then gets a care card. This care card has a little number on it, and the number allows her to call when she has any special needs, questions, or ideas. On the back of the card, she can also join an online community that is anonymous and is probably filled with people like her that are terrified about opening up, but know they have hepatitis C and are probably pretty sick. For Luke, awareness comes in a different way. Remember, trying to send a letter to Luke is useless when he doesn't have an address. But what you can do is try and go towards Luke in some way. So what is it that Luke does on a regular basis? He buys syringes. So what if the packet of syringes acted like that letter for Luke? That packet of syringes, every time he opens it, says, hey, Luke, stay safe. Every time as he takes out a syringe, he's thinking, okay, well, maybe I should keep this one to myself. This green stay safe message becomes the way to try and remind Luke that he's at risk. What also happens is that this package, because he buys it at the pharmacy, can also contain this barcode. And the barcode is scanned at the pharmacy where he can also get a health check. His care card, though, acts in a different way because it gives him vouchers to be able to top them up for transport needs, for grocery needs, what we try to do with this care card is try to solve his most pressing need so that he can think about his health. But also, if you're Luke and have nothing, actually having a care card suddenly feels very empowering. Somebody cares and I have a card. So really, as I said before, it's about humanizing this healthcare system. It's about making it work for all humans. And what I mean by that is that we redesign a healthcare system that not only works for me, but that works for me and Luke. Thank you very much.